Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to all of you to this first webinar session, Refugee Finance in Times of Uncertainty, Mitigating Risk and Identifying Opportunities. I want to thank all of you for making time to join us for this important discussion today. And I also want to extend our gratitude to Triple Jump and MFC for sponsoring this event today. We are looking forward to hearing your voices and the voices of the panelists during the session and during the breakout sessions. My name is Michael Kortenbusch. I'm the Managing Director of Business and Finance Consulting. And I will be today your moderator. I'm joined by a high profile panel of experts in the matter from various international organizations, including the World Bank and the United Nations. And let me now introduce to you one by one, starting with Ms. Liliana Pozzo, who is working for the IFC World Bank Group, where she is a sustainable finance advisory services manager. I also would like to introduce you to Ms. Nicole Pistelli, who is working at the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees as a Senior Financial Inclusion Coordinator. And she's joined also by Ms. Susanne Klink, Senior Livelihood and Economic Inclusion Officer at the United Nations Refugee Agency. Then we have Mr. Malchas Jajua here with us, a financial inclusion and strategy expert who has been for 15 years the CEO of the Georgian MFI, Crystal. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce you to Katerina Dan Danilchenko. She is joining us from the Ukraine, where she is the CEO of Credit Info, risk management specialist. Welcome to all of you. And we will be discussing today a number of very important topics, including the immediate needs of refugees, the immediate financial needs of refugees, then the role of financial service providers in responding to the needs of financial, the financial needs of refugees. Finally, we will look at support required from donor organizations to boost financial inclusion of refugees, but also we would like to understand better what regulatory adjustments are needed in order to enhance the environment that is needed to make financial services for refugees flourish. Our panelists will give short presentations during the 90 minutes we have ahead of us. Then we will have at the end of our session, we will have three breakout sessions for individual discussions in groups. And we will aim to answer your questions, which we very much welcome. And you can post your questions into the comment section of the Zoom screen and we'll pick them up either during the session or at the end. If we cannot manage to answer all questions, they will be answered in writing to you. And let's not, uh, now get started. I would like at first to hand over the floor to Ms. Susanne Klink to set the stage about some key facts relevant for understanding the refugee crisis and also the needs of Ukrainian refugees in dedicated financial services. Susanne, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Michael. And thank you, distinguished panelists and everyone in attendance. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. To establish a framework for understanding how we can best help with the refugee crisis, it is important to first examine the situation as it is today. Um, I will present you briefly some key figures and facts based on the latest data available. So first of all, this is the fastest growing refugee crisis since World War II and with more than 5.2 million refugees who have fled Ukraine since the start of the war. 90% of them are women and children who often left behind their husbands and who are now the main caregivers of the family. In addition to the refugees, we also have 7.7 .7 million internally displaced persons in Ukraine 
and there are an additional 13 million persons stranded in conflict-affected areas. As the situation is rapidly evolving, we will share the link to the UNHCR dashboard uh, with the data portal, where you can find the latest statistics updated each day. In terms of the response measures, it's important that, different to many other refugee crises, this is the government-led response. UNHCR and the international community is supporting the government in their efforts to, to provide assistance and protection to refugees. Um, I hope you can hear me better now. Um, so UNHCR is supporting the government in, in the response and for this has set up uh, the Regional Refugee Response Plan, uh, which it is leading together with, with more than 100 organizations that are involved in the Ukraine neighboring countries. Um, the main focus is on providing humanitarian assistance and protection, but there is also an importance from the onset to ensure a humanitarian development or humanitarian inclusion nexus in order to support the socioeconomic inclusion of refugees from the onset. The Temporary Protection Directive um, is the key protection measure that has been set up in the, in the European Union and has been activated for the first time ever on March 4th, and it grants refugees key rights from the onset, including, among others, residency rights, social welfare systems, access to EU labor markets, access to banking services, and freedom of movement within the EU. Uh, we will also share a link to the, to the temporary protection directive in the chat so that you can have a closer look on the different rights. In addition, in Moldova, which is not a EU country, um, there's also um, a similar temporary protection um, directive in place in order to support uh, refugees and, and grant access to their rights. In terms of the, the response, uh, as I said, this is based on humanitarian assistance and protection mainly as part of an emergency response. And in this framework, cash-based interventions have been set up in order to bridge the gap until refugees are able to, to access social protection or are able to um, access livelihoods and um, be able to, to economically integrate. Um, obviously, such a massive influx of refugees has put strains on a number of systems, including those of governments and regulatory agencies and those of financial service providers. If we look at the government level challenges, uh, the first one is the, the TPD application. As I said, the temporary protection directive has been activated on March 4th um, at the EU level, but now each member state of the EU has to define how to apply the temporary protection directive and other forms of international protection within their legal systems. In addition, not all refugees are accessing the temporary protection directive, but may also be seeking asylum. In addition, there are strained services in refugee hosting countries, uh, which are causing delays in registration processes, as well as issues accessing necessary documentation and some of the key services. Um, while refugees have rights to, to access financial systems, there are issues um, balancing these rights, for example, the access to a basic bank account with AML CFT requirements. Um, we will also share in the chat the, the EVA opinion on asylum seekers' access to, to bank accounts, uh, which has been issued prior to the crisis a couple of years ago. When we look at the challenges um, for financial service providers, um, the first one is that there are um, documentation requirements that vary across the country and the financial institutions. So there's not one single um, guidance as to documentation that is being required in order to, to access specific financial services. Financial service providers also often lack awareness of refugees' financial needs, as well as multilingual procedures and information and smooth the processes for, for accessing services. There are also some reports of discrimination among refugees. There are limited options for exchanging um, 
hyvnia, the, the local currency in Ukraine. Even when avail available exchange rates are often low due to a general lack of demand for the currency. The Central Bank of Ukraine has imposed a limit of 100,000 hyvnia um, per month, which is around 3,000 um, euros on cash withdrawals abroad. abroad. At the same time, fees for withdrawals made abroad have largely been abolished by the different financial service providers. Refugees currently have uh, very limited access to, to credit options in the host countries. I think it will be very important to keep these key statistics and key challenges in mind as we go forward in our discussion today. Thank you. Susanne, as I understand from uh, your words, uh, the TPD, um, the Temporary Protection Directive gives, uh, gives a very important roof, basically a frame um, under which each country has to develop their own um, regulations, how to execute this and how to live this. And uh, my question would be, uh, if you uh, think the challenges you mentioned on the F F FSP level, is this something that really the FSPs can um, do themselves or um, are the local, the local regulations also uh, still an issue, they need to be adjusted um, as far as you can see this from, uh, from a broader perspective. Uh, in my view, it's important for, uh, for the financial service providers to advocate and draw attention to the issue because it may not be um, fully recognized by the national authorities. So it's important to get yeah, to also mention this challenge in general and also to um, to see how internally within a financial um, service provider there can be clear rules regarding the documentation requirements because we often see that at the headquarters level there is for example an interest in supporting refugees and accessing banking services but at the different branch offices there are different requirements regarding um, documentation, for example, to open a bank account. One ask, some ask for biometric passports, some ask for passports, some ask for IDs. So it would be important that also within the financial service providers, there's a clear understanding of what is being required in order to, to access financial services, even as at the national level, there's no clear regulation in this regard. Over. Okay, thank you very much, Susanna, again, for your concise presentation. And that brings me right away to the next uh, speaker. So I'd like to hand over the floor to Ms. Nicole Pistelli. And Nicole, she will be walking us through the financial demand cycle for refugees. And she will also uh, talk about concrete measures that financial service providers uh, could consider um, and then nav navigate through the refugee crisis. And Nicole, we much look forward to your presentation. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, you can go, yes, thank you, to the next slide. And thank you, everyone, for participating in today's session. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'll be speaking today about refugees' financial services needs, as well as the ways financial service providers can start considering them as a potential target market. I do have a cold, as you might be hearing, so apologies for my voice, but I hope you can still hear me clearly. So when thinking at the potential refugee market, uh, it's uh, important to understand that refugees are not a homogeneous group. In fact, they are socioeconomically diverse and their financial needs uh, evolve over time with their displacement phase and their future plans for migration. So looking at the displacement phase, uh, we can segment refugees' financial services needs according to four main phases, as you can see in the slide uh, uh, here. Uh, the first one uh, is the time of arrival. So here the demand is mostly for survival cash, for housing, food, medical services, uh, sometimes for repaying debt incurred during escape. And very importantly, as we have seen with the Ukrainians, is the receipt of remittances from family at home or in, in third countries. Then the second phase is the one of early displacement, so the first months. Here the focus is on access to housing, education, learning the language, work, even business startup might be considered. Financial services demand uh, is mostly for opening deposit accounts, again remittances, but also consumer credit, for example, for furniture, loans to pay school fees might be needed, maybe even startup business equipment or health insurance. 
On the phase three is the one of protracted displacement. So more or less after one year that refugees are in the host countries. Here, the financial services really uh, demand really expands. So there is often need for loans, uh, for housing improvement, business loans, as well as transactional accounts for cross-border payments, again, remittances. There is often also demand for no financial services, just job placement, vocational, uh, business training, or linkages to markets and value chains. And finally, we have uh, the, the fourth phase, the one of permanence, when refugees decide to stay in the country. So here, uh, the demand for financial services really uh, is similar to the one of the host country nationals. In addition to, to the services I just mentioned, there are, for example, pension plans or insurance products. There are also refugees that might be looking for, however, returning to their home country or resettling elsewhere. And in this case, really interesting are the transferable credit histories in case they've been uh, getting a loan in the host countries or transferable pension schemes. So if we move forward to thinking about how financial service providers can prepare for meeting the financial needs of refugees, it might be helpful referring to an action framework which has been designed as part of a guide for financial service providers, which has been developed by UNHCR in partnership with the Social Performance Task Force. Uh, you should be seeing the link in the chat box. This framework uh, entails uh, six steps for a financial service provider to follow. So let's quickly go over each of them. The first step is about conducting a scoping study. As for any new market segment, you will have questions related to the potential market size, the viability of the business, the credit risk, profitability, even reputation risk of your institution in serving refugees, depending on context. So the first steps, uh, you should, as a financial service provider, you should be looking for relevant data that can help uh, you doing a first screening of the market. And here, a humanitarian agencies such as UNSCR or local development agency can be of help. Uh, this is about uh, uh, collecting basic demographic information, but also hopefully getting data about vocational business training received, access to startup financing, access to bank accounts, description of enterprises, and so on. Importantly here, you should also be asking existing funders, investors, shareholders, whether they are interested in the new venture. And here, I would just like to flag that uh, Kiva, the crowdfunding platform, has uh, opened a window for refugee lending. You can get more information by going on the Kiva website, and several financial institutions have already been using it. The second step is generating the strategy. So at this time, it is a good idea to identify a champion within your institution who ultimately can be responsible for the development of the strategy of serving refugees. This person could be staff from the research and development department, some from, someone from your social performance management committee, if you have one, or an executive board even member. Um, and the strategy should look at how to outreach the new market segment, as well as your marketing approach, what are the uh, eligibility and the present criteria to be adjusted. We've seen that it's often useful to hire a new staff member from the refugee community who speak the language and of course can help with, with marketing and outreach. The third step is about the research of this new market segment. So here, a financial institution should use the contacts already established in the scoping phase to seek out groups of refugees. So uh, institutions should make them essentially visible as a potential service provider by meeting and posting information material in appropriate language, for example, at UNHCR offices or social development centers in town where refugees gather, even considering using online platform social media, which may be used by refugees. These are really important meetings. We have observed them in many countries where financial institutions have been serving refugees because it's the first really point of interaction to collect data on interest and, and also prior and current use of financial and non-financial services by refugees. Refugees. Then the step uh, four is to segment the potential clients to determine whom you want to serve. Segmentation essentially means dividing a client base into groups with similar characteristics. So here you can look at migration plans, language skill, local market familiarity, uh, with the material wealth, so assets, income versus household expenses, financial education level, financial service experience and preferences, if they have any um, current or prior uh, business experience. And of course, these are aspects that can also be determined at a later stage during the loan application and the appraisal process. 
Then on step five, uh, here uh, it's really about reviewing and adjusting eligibility and appraisal criteria. So typically, an FSP does not need to make drastic revisions to existing eligibility criteria uh, that they use for national clients when it comes to serving refugees. This is uh, confirmed by many data that we've been collecting by financial institutions all over geographies. However, there is always a need uh, to make some minor adjustments in order to ensure that the new client segment uh, will actually be eligible for your services. For example, small changes in emission statements, adding eligibility filters that exclude the refugees that you cannot serve. For example, you can say, just gonna serve refugees that have been in the countries for at least three months um, and uh, um, for minimum three months. Uh, and then they plan to stay for at least 12 months. And then, of, of course, what is very important is what Suzanne was mentioning before is the documentation. So uh, you have to look at what your FSP require also of course, in according to the KYC requirements, uh, if there is any specific type of, uh, type of documentation or proof of residence that you ask, because this may automatically exclude most of the refugees you want to serve. And then finally, the last step is to conduct a pilot test and compile data for the business case. So a pilot test is often useful to gain insight into which products uh, would work best and also to provide detailed information on how your institution can best market services to the new client segments, how, to, um, how the products can, can be delivered, should be delivered, which adjustments may be necessary in operation, and how you can also best identify and mitigate the risks to ensure uh, eventually profitability. So uh, financial institutions often have questions related to strategies to follow to reduce credit risk. It's uh, their main concern. Uh, while every context is different, uh, here uh, I just outlined uh, some practices that have been followed by a number of financial institutions all over the world with experience serving refugees. Um, uh, which uh, we know that uh, can be quite useful. So we already spoke about the, the importance of segmentation of refugees by displacement phase. Another area is to assess refugees' intentions to remain or to relocate. And here we have observed the really importance uh, of, the, of a strong communication channel between loan officers and clients, for example, conducting regular business visits, which also allow to find out whether refugees have imminent plans to return to their home or relocate. Then it's about assessing refugees' profile. We talked before about the importance of, of collecting data, but also assessing you know, character, the character, personality, verify the regular sending of remittances to have a better understanding of their cash flow. Um, also allow refugees guarantors or incentivize local guarantors. In, in some countries, a financial institutions have been providing loans to refugees who do not have an active residence permit. And in that case, they were still able to do that as long as, as they had a guarantor with a valid residence permit. Um, of course, they require collateral for loans. Uh, if necessary, some institutions um, do that. Uh, Use alternative credit scoring technologies. This is pretty new. It has been tested in some geographies like Jordan, Lebanon. Essentially, they are up um, uh, that have been developed to, to track refugees' financial transactions to improve their credit history. And then lastly is something that um, Liliano by FC will be talking about is the importance, of course, of verifying credit history with financial institutions in Ukraine, if possible. Uh, thank you very much. Nicole, thank you very much. That was a great overview. Um, one question from my side. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning on uh, slide six, step one, about the scoping studies and the other steps you mentioned then. Uh, is there anything um, in the region that you are aware of that is underway? You mentioned Kiva already. Thanks for sharing that. But are there any other studies or uh, efforts underway that could be potentially shared with other participants? Are you aware of any? Not yet, but there is a proposal for a study. Um, so UNCDF, I don't know if there is any member on um, uh, here present, but uh, they've been already thinking about the potential of, uh, of supporting financial service institution to do a demand and the supply side assessment. Uh, so, you know, this, this could be something of, of interest and um, I'm sure that also IFC is interested into looking at, at market assessment. So nothing available yet, but institutions are, are discussing that. Okay, excellent. Thanks a lot, Nicole. And that brings me uh, directly to the next speaker. So we're hearing now Malchas Zadzua and maybe Malchas, you can shed a bit of light uh, on uh, the question what financial service providers in the region right now um, are experiencing, uh, are actually doing uh, 
in order um, to cope with challenges, also um, to um, seize opportunities that come up. Uh, Malchas, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, and all the other great panelists and attendees of this interesting webinar. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. Uh, today, I want to talk about the direct impact of the crisis on uh, financial service providers in the countries neighboring Ukraine, as well as opportunities to assist financial inclusion of refugees via both financial and non-financial services. So let's start with the key facts that we have seen so far. First of all, um, the quality of uh, financial service providers' uh, loan portfolio has deteriorated just slightly. But overall, it is under control within acceptable level and still better than at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's kind of good news for FSPs. Uh, many institutions have limited or completely abandoned new lending to some business sectors, especially those enterprises with import or export and trade operations in world Belarus, Russia, and Ukraine. There have been uh, no significant or unexpected deposit withdrawals so far. In fact, many refugees are opening uh, bank accounts in host countries and transferring their savings to local banks. Uh, due to the high level of uncertainty and uh, increased regional risks, the, some important business decisions have been postponed or temporarily suspended by some GFIs and MIVs, such, a, such as limited in-depth financing, equity investments, and other operations. And many FSPs in host countries are reluctant to exchange Hilnia to into the local currency. In response, uh, the European Commission has recently suggested that member states set up a scam that all of the refugees to exchange up to 310 euro free of charge and at the official rate established by the Central Bank of Ukraine. So practically speaking, this means that uh, so far, the refugee crisis has had the low to moderate direct impact on FSPs in neighboring countries. Uh, and at this stage, institutions have been more affected by the indirect impact of the crisis, especially the tightening of sanctions against Russia, which includes the flow of remittances, tourist sector, export import operations, higher prices, etc. So we can also say that um, uh, we can also say that uh, anticipated loan uh, losses are expected from five to from five to 20% based on uh, assumptions of the many FSPs, as clients with business operations in Belarus, Russia, and Ukraine face significant challenges. The rising prices and reduced consumption are expected to result in decreased loan portfolio growth for many FSPs. So some institutions are even projecting negative growth in 2020, 2022 in their worst scenario. So one of the challenge, key challenges which we observe is also that FSPs are also expected to see new fraud attempts, including those related to ID manipulation, falsification of information and documentation of refugee, as well as massive phishing campaigns. Uh, many FSPs currently lack the necessary administrative resources and competencies to cope with large number of clients and operations. They also need to adequately monitor all financial transactions, including IML, KYC issues, uh, and so on. As FSPs increase their focus on responding to Ukraine crisis, other important organizational issues could be overlooked, resulting in internal organizational tensions, losses in market positions, and uh, decreased competitiveness. So next slide, we see uh, that, that the current situation regarding financial services and, of, and refugees. So we see that at the current moment, the most in demand financial services among refugees are bank accounts, bank cards, money transfer services, and currency exchanges. So these are the top four leading uh, financial products that are in high demand from uh, refugees. However, as more and more refugees begin uh, to start their business activities in host countries, we expect to see an increased demand for microfinance, small business finance, and startup finance products. So this means that uh, there are some real opportunities for financial service providers to offer competitive and high uh, and right products to the market, particularly uh, FSPs can lean uh, into already established refugee financing models, such as group lending with uh, its various modifications, 
also combining loans with small grant opportunities from other uh, NGOs and humanitarian organizations, supporting joint business proposals of refugees with local entrepreneurs, uh, employing social enterprise funding model, et, et cetera. The institutions can also actively collaborate with international donors, local NGOs, government funding programs, and other uh, institutions, including other FSPs, to offer combined financial and social uh, services to refugees so they can share the risks and costs with other stakeholders. And there are very good business models proving this um, efficiency of this collaboration. And the FSPs can also offer special programs and conditions for refugees. For example, we all, all already have the fact that FSPs have announced commission-free money transfer services for refugees and offer no commission uh, uh, services to and from Ukraine uh, when uh, the refugees are making the uh, remittances. Uh, next slide. Um, in next slide, we can see that financial service providers also have some opportunities to provide the valuable non-financial services to refugees. This can include the following. The institutions can offer direct employment opportunities for refugees, especially temporary or permanent job position for banking and IT sector professionals, because we know that many refugees from Ukraine, they are very high qualified, especially in banking, finance and IT sphere. Uh, some FSPs also are going to offer a summer internship program for student refugees, so that will be also another uh, type of the employment opportunities. Uh, FSPs can also establish direct communication with the refugee community to better understand their financial and non-financial needs and expectations. So they have good opportunities to design and offer the right products and solutions for refugees. Uh, institutions can support refugees in their job search pro process, so generally uh, in job search projects, process. For example, they can connect qualified refugees with their business clients who are in need of such professional working forces. And finally, FSPs, as well as their individual employees, can also do pro bono services, especially through collaborations within the social, educational, and humanitarian local initiatives focused on, on refugees. So this was a brief overview of the current situation with the refugee finance in neighboring countries. Thank you for your time and uh, participation. Marha, thank you very much for the overview. Um, I have uh, two quick questions to you. Uh, one is on slide six, you meant on slide nine, I think you mentioned the perspective perspectives and um, there was uh, nothing written about consumer finance. Do you expect also consumer finance to be demanded by refugees uh, in the future? Yes, and not only in the future, but we today we also see the consumer demand, and which is also uh, it has a different aspects uh, because uh, we understand that today it is humanitarian need and basic social needs are dominating, uh, and uh, including also the the, um, the new loans which are used for repaying all the existing loans in, in your kind, but in the future uh, I think this demand will grow up uh, in parallel of uh, growing the demand for the startup and business loans. Definitely, yes. Okay, good. Thanks. And my other question is, um, when speaking about the FSPs in the region, uh, we have some FSPs that have uh, offices in Ukraine and at the same time in other countries. So FSPs from Hungary or Austria traditionally have been working in Ukraine, but also in the whole region. So um, can you have, uh, do you have any information about how um, these institutions are working with refugees? Because one would assume uh, that might be easier for them uh, to uh, coordinate maybe activities between each other across the border. Yes, definitely. It is much easier for to coordinate because uh, they, they have better access to information and uh, the, the database of the clients, potential their potential clients. Because uh, as we know, that the, one of the main problem uh, of, the, uh, of the lending to refugees will be access to data, access to their credit history and uh, all other business information which they have in Ukraine. And uh, if the, the access of this information will be easy to, to, to get for the uh, FSPs, of course, they will have much more and better chances to offer uh, refugees uh, the good uh, and right financial products. Marhaf, thank you very much. And uh, that brings me directly to the next speaker, Ms. Liliana Pozzo. And she will be speaking about the great work that the World Bank has been doing. But actually, um, regarding to my last question, um, the um, matter of how uh, the coordination between FSPs 
uh, in host countries and the Ukraine and FSPs in Ukraine can happen in a better way and uh, to improve overall financial inclusion benefits for the refugees. Uh, so Liliana, we much look forward uh, to being shared your experience. Thank you, Michael, and thank you all to all the other panelists that are now the good work that you're doing. Just briefly to introduce what the World Bank Group is doing and what I've seized and as part of the World Bank Group. In general, um, the World Bank Group supports member countries and emerging markets to reduce extreme poverty and boost shared prosperity. I see as a private sector arm of the World Bank Group and finances private sector investments, um, including providing technical assistance to businesses and, and governments. And I'll talk a bit about what we're doing specifically with the Ukrainian refugees in this space. As Nicole mentioned, we have been very actively working together actually in Latin America with the Venezuelan refugees and hope to bring that experience to, to Europe. As it relates to the war in Ukraine, specifically more than $925 million um, has been mobilized for uh, critical services to Ukrainians. Um, this funding is being used to both um, for the purchase of or the import of goods and services such as medicines into the country, oil, et cetera, as well as we're providing through our multi-donor trust fund, as well as our crisis response program, funding to neighboring countries so that they can actually not only neighboring countries, but countries in the Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa that are suffering from food shortages due to the war in um, purchasing um, these kinds of goods. IFC specifically is supporting um, these businesses in terms of financing new war-related challenges, again, around the agricultural space, but also looking for the, you know, once the war has ended, hopefully soon, um, investments in terms of infrastructure, in terms of rebuilding the country and the kind of private sector mobilization that will be needed in order to accomplish this. Specifically around um, our financial inclusion work uh, with the Ukrainian refugees in neighboring countries, I'm gonna speak um, in the next slide about our cross-border data sharing credit bureau project that Nicole referred to. And Makas, also you mentioned the importance of this credit bureau information in terms of doing credit assessments of this population in neighboring countries. And, and with this, as Nicole um, explained in terms of the approach that FSPs should be taking around designing products, both financial and non-financial products for the Ukrainians abroad, um, really looking at doing um, market assessments of the neighboring countries. So at this time, Poland, with a focus on Poland, Romania, and Moldova, in terms of really understanding these sub-segments, as Nicole has um, really described around the kinds of people, the kinds of uh, plans they have in their host countries in terms of do they you know, are they former SME owners and they wish to open a business in their now uh, new home, that sort of thing. So really helping FSPs understand the business, the segments and the potential products and services that could be introduced to this population. At this moment, what we're doing specifically around the credit bureaus and here, what we're trying to address are the challenges in terms of access to credit. So as you've all heard, um, banks are opening accounts given that this population has been given, um, they've been regularized, let's say, in terms of their stay within the EU countries. And so KYC is being done in a, on a limited basis. Um, accounts have, are being opened. Um, there have been some kind of money transfer FX uh, services being provided, but we are really looking, um, as, as Nicole mentioned and, and Susanna as well, at expanding that access to credit to really making sure that this population is fully uh, integrated into their host communities. And, and part of that access to credit, as has been described, is really helping banks understand, be able to complete full KYC, be able to comply with all AML, we have regulatory requirements, as well as having an understanding of this individual's credit, past credit behavior in Ukraine. So of course their financial situation is quite different um, given the, the war and their um, emigration from Ukraine, but it really gives financial institutions a view of the past credit behavior of the individuals in terms of um, their credit in Ukraine under their normal, let's say, situation. So what we're doing here specifically is working with the three Ukrainian credit bureaus, and we will hear from Katya after um, 
um, I, my part where, you know, Credit Info is, is very actively uh, participating in this, in this uh, program with us in terms of helping them develop commercial relationships with the credit bureaus in Poland, Romania, Moldova, uh, the rest of the EU in being able to digitally, digitally connect and therefore incorporate the credit bureau information from Ukraine into credit scorings um, for these uh, EU countries in order to be able to do more comprehensive credit underwriting of these individuals to offer them um, access to finance in the future. So that is ongoing right now. Um, hopefully by the end of this summer, we will have connectivity in Poland specifically and be able to really um, fully advance in the incorporation of this population um, in terms of their financial inclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Liliana. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing these insights. Uh, I have one question to you. Um, uh, if you uh, look at the challenges uh, that are uh, standing uh, in front of, uh, of actually uh, receiving more integration, is it more on the technical side or uh, also uh, do we talk about regulatory adjustments that probably need more time uh, than, uh, than dealing with technical matters? I mean, I, I will ask my, my fellow uh, panelists to correct me if I'm wrong, at least from my perspective, I don't think there is a, a requirement for regulatory changes in the EU. It's more of actually the, the Ukrainian population has really been, or, or the EU has been very open to receiving this population and in, in offering them a legal status within the economic bloc, which is quite an advance, let's say, to perhaps other populations from other parts of the world. Um, and so really that the intention is to commercially link in the case of this credit bureau program, the two or the, the various institutions to be able to access data. So it's not really a, a technical challenge. It's more of something in the works, let's say. There's no challenge around it. It's just quite new given you know the two months that have um, only gone by since the start of the war, but it's really to, you know, for that digital integration um, of the credit bureaus to be able to facilitate this important credit um, history into the, the EU um, system, the financial system. So I wouldn't say that there are really any requirements for concrete regulatory change. It's much more the um, short time frame that has transpired um, since the start of the war and the work that needs to be done to integrate, you know, two commercial or, or various commercial entities around a credit information sharing. Okay, great, uh, Liana. Thanks for clarifying that. And that brings us directly uh, to our next speaker. And that's exactly about uh, exchanging data. So Katerina Delinchenko, she's uh, in charge of uh, the credit bureau. Uh, so, uh, Katerina, please enlighten us a bit about uh, the question, um, how we can make the data you're collecting and processing work for the benefit of the Ukrainian refugees. Katerina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michal. Thank you, Liliana, for this uh, intro and clarification provided. And thank you for all panelists and participants. It's really great speaking to all of you today. And exactly, I would like to discuss how financial service providers in host countries can work more easily with refugees by facilitating connections with the uh, credit information. Uh, specifically, I am talking on behalf of the Credit Info Ukraine, uh, IBCH. Uh, that's one of the main credit bureaus in Ukraine that is the member of Ukrainian Banking Association, FinTech Association, and European Business Association and uh, has been operating on the market for uh, more than 16 years already. Uh, so it covers majority of the active credit population information in Ukraine. Here on the slide, you can see more details. So we have the information on 15 million unique individuals and with more than 52 million uh, contracts associated with the credit histories. So this is the exactly the credit history information shared with us by banks, microfinancial institutions, and credit unions. 
the average heat rate is around 82%, which shows to you quite a good coverage of the overall credit history information in Ukraine. Also, we have a good value-added products such as bureau scores and portfolio analytics uh, provided and offered on the Ukrainian market. Um, and yeah, on the next slide, you can see these three main uh, solutions, how to integrate and receive the information on the uh, credit or the, the credit reports for individuals from Ukraine. Uh, specifically, we work together in the working group, as was mentioned by Liliana, with IFP on making the cooperation with the local credit bureaus, so um, on, on, on the uh, host market. And uh, uh, we have the different discussion on the different markets already, and it's progressing quite well. Uh, we don't expect a lot of the technical issues in terms of the integration. Uh, however, uh, we work together also with IFT and with Central Bank of Ukraine uh, to align all the legal perspectives of, of uh, this cooperation. Uh, all in, from the technical point of view, also the lenders, they can connect this information uh, applying the adjusted types of the consents, applying the uh, different uh, specific KYC procedures and use the uh, these solutions, applying and uh, having the access uh, for the uh, software, the service approach or to have the uh, instant decision manager from Credit Info uh, Ukraine specific, uh, specifically uh, is step, um, implemented in-house. That's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Katerina. Um, my question would be to you, um, with which countries uh, are you establishing now cooperation or have established already cooperation, uh, neighboring countries that are hosting refugees from the Ukraine? So we have the dialogues with uh, most of the countries, actually most of the EU countries. We have some uh, dialogues uh, with some partners from UK and US markets uh, and uh, talking to specific lenders there. And also we have a very, uh, uh, I would say very practical dialogue with the Baltics. So with Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, exactly after this call, I will have the next sessions with them and uh, uh, to, to, to get the earliest uh, and uh, feedback from, from their markets on the, uh, on all documentations provided already. Thank you very much, Katarina. And uh, as we are very much on time with our uh, time schedule we have here, we should become on time to the next call as well. So thanks. Um, Thank and with that, um, I would like to hand back the floor uh, to Ms. Susanne Klink. And uh, Susanne is uh, ready now to give us a bit of uh, insights into uh, priorities for regulatory adjustments uh, something that has been um, uh, mentioned before already. So, Zuzana, we are with impatience looking forward uh, to your next presentation. Thanks again, Michael, and everybody here. Um, as I begin, it is important to note that the current legal framework for refugees' access to financial services is, in principle, favorable. Um, that being said, there are some necessary regulatory framework adjustments that need to be made in order to boost refugee financial inclusion. Most notably, there needs to be in place um, specific references to refugees, asylum seekers, the temporary protection directive and other forms of international protection in national laws and policies, because oftentimes refugees are not specifically mentioned and this way financial service providers may not be aware of their rights to access financial services. So it's important to, to refer specifically to refugees. Second, it's important, as we already have discussed before, that there are well-defined documentation requirements by the regulatory bodies for opening bank accounts in order to, to have clear guidance for financial service providers on what is being required and to avoid uh, unclarity by, um, by branch offices in what is being required um, in terms of documentation for, for example, opening bank accounts. Besides, it's important to have regulatory guidance on refugees' rights to bank accounts versus how to address AML and CTF risks in order to, to provide legal certainty 
to financial service providers. It's also important to have increased trainings for financial service provider staff on refugee finance, on refugees in general, and also common refugee access to, to finance issues. Besides, it's fundamental to, to provide support to microfinance institutions in opening large scale refugee access to, to financial instruments in order to, to financially support them in offering their products to refugees. Finally, it's fundamental to, to develop and establish clear procedures for monitoring effective access to financial services, which uh, should have data which is disaggregated by the legal status in order to, to identify key gaps in terms of refugees accessing financial services and be thus able to, to take uh, actionable measures in order to, to address these gaps. In addition, I would like to also share a few other notes to keep in mind as we move forward in developing actionable solutions. As I've said, this is a rapidly evolving situation. So because the temporary protection directive is just applied as of March 4th, um, this may raise new challenges in terms of the regulatory, regulatory framework because governments are only applying it now to, to the national systems and because people are still on the move, there may be additional challenges that are not yet fully understood or not even present because um, not everything is fully defined yet. Um, second, uh, the duration of the temporary protection can negatively impact access to microcredits and loans of refugees because uh, depending on the, the duration of the residence permit, um, refugees may be um, eligible or not for a financial service providers to, to access the credit. If somebody has a residence permit of one year until March 4th next year, but is only asking for a credit in, in January or February next year, of course, it is very difficult for financial service providers to provide credit because the person does not have a residence permit that will last the whole duration, duration of, of repaying the credit. Um, finally, um, as I said, the situation is still rapidly evolving and with a current focus on the emergency response. And as a result, we still have uh, limited data available on the socioeconomic inclusion needs and profiles of refugees. Assessments have started and we expect more data to be available in the next months, but still we don't have a full picture of the situation and uh, this may also negatively impact um, the full assessment of uh, um, changes needed in the regulatory framework. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susanne. Um, any, um, uh, any information from the front uh, in countries, in neighboring countries, I mean, uh, in terms of whether regulation has been already adjusted or is being adjusted or activities that are happening at that, uh, at that end? Um, yeah. um, Mm -hmm. Well, in general, as I said, the temporary protection directive is just being adjusted. So for now, the focus is very much on this. And in principle, the, the TPD grants access to financial services. But as we have seen that refugees are still very much in the emergency phase, there is not yet a focus on the longer term uh, financial service needs. So I have not seen much uh, neither needs nor practical adjustments on, on the regulatory framework. Yeah. Um, yeah. Probably right now the focus is really on the short term uh, to fix um, uh, the, the first needed priorities basically and then um, take a second look when uh, situation is a bit more uh, predictable, let's say, yeah, um, how long refugees will stay and so on. But yep. um, that makes good sense. Thanks a lot, Susanne. Perhaps, sorry, just to add, because, I mean, we are now focusing very much on the Ukraine situation and the response, but we have seen these challenges already for, for refugees from other nationalities and in other contexts. So these are challenges that are still present and some governments already have it on their the table, not necessarily with relation to the Ukraine response, but are having a closer look in order to see how adjustment can be made in order to, to facilitate effective access to financial services. And this very much depends uh, where things stand at on, on each EU member country and also non-EU countries. But in principle, there uh, we can say that 
about more than half of the countries in the EU, for example, have a favorable, um, not, well, not only the legal framework, which is in place in, in all countries, but also um, have favorable practical access to, to bank accounts, for example. While in some other countries where there is no clear guidance yet from, from the national bank, vis-a-vis -vis refugees' access to, to bank accounts, this is still more cumbersome, independent of the Ukraine situation. Um, but we are trying to push on this from, from the UNHCR side in order to, to engage national banks, um, providing more, um, more clear guidance to financial service providers in this regard. Over. Excellent. Very good, Susanna. Thank you very much for this update. And uh, that's great to see that um, there's so much uh, effort to create an enabling environment um, through, um, through these adjustments. Thank you. All right. So, um, dear uh, participants of this webinar, now is your hour, basically, not an hour, but uh, we speak about 15 minutes. Now is your time. Uh, we really hope um, you have been warmed up with the topic. I mean, you were before, we are sure, but uh, so we have three breakout rooms. So logically, it's clear that we um, have uh, the three groups by what we discussed already. So we have a group one, Refugees Perspective, yeah, which is um, headed by Liliana and Susanna. They will chair the group. And then we have Malchas and Katerina taking care of the FSP perspective. And the group three will be DFIs, regulated and other stakeholders um, will be um, under the coordination of Mikol. And um, to keep things logistically simple, we just have taken the liberty to assign you randomly uh, to groups. So hopefully we have a good hit hit rate that you are happy with um, with the theme you get, but all themes are important. And uh, as I said, we have 15 minutes. So um, you are now assigned to your groups and we'll meet again um, in this uh, big room uh, after 15 minutes. And then we'll hear short summary statements from the hosts of each of the breakout rooms. So wishing you a good discussion and really make opportunity to make the um, use of, uh, of, the, of your possibility to voice your opinion, to ask questions, and to actively participate. See you soon. Uh, in terms of what are the key challenges uh, um, that Ukrainian refugees have, I think, you know, in Europe, things have been quite different in terms of the acceptance that the EU has had of, of this population. And therefore, um, banks are opening accounts. It's not something you see in other jurisdictions, let's say, in such a quick time frame. Um, so the Ukrainians have really benefited from that. I think the, the real challenge, as we've been discussing, is credit, right, in terms of, at least from other um, countries, when talking to financial institutions, they've indicated we don't know who these people are. <clears throat> in terms of their credit history, their credit behavior. So really everything that we can do jointly to give an overview and to help FSPs really understand the segments as, as we've been describing in, the, in terms of their financial needs, in terms of where they are in their migrant migratory process, let's say, you know, from the immediate, can't remember how you were, you phrased it, but you know, the immediate cash needs and FX needs to the more I'm fully integrated into my host country, there are um, there's kind of a progression of financial services needs that come with that, and so um, really helping uh, financial institutions of all kinds, so MFIs, cooperatives, banks, understand that segment of the population <clears throat> and the different uh, financial needs that um, correspond to these, and how to design products and services is with a different, you know, alternative uses of data, like the credit information from Ukraine with a very different reality, <clears throat> obviously, um, is, is one of the challenges that we, at least at IFC, um, are trying to overcome. Susan, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. No, thanks a lot, Liliana. I would like to give the floor to, to participants because I already spoke um, <laughs> in the presentation on what is our perspective regarding the, the challenges and the needs for refugees. But I, I would really like to, to know from your side if you would echo what, what we have been saying, if you are seeing any other challenges, if you think that anything that we said is not true in your specific context. And when you speak, it would be great if you could briefly mention uh, your institution and the country where you are based and then share your observations. Thank you.
And as we are such a small group, please just feel free to unmute your mic and, and speak right away. Thanks. Hi, I guess I will start. Uh, my name is Katerina. I'm from Belarusian Narodny Bank. Uh, it's located in Belarus. And uh, I was wondering, maybe there are some special like uh, financing programs for refugees, maybe some uh, waivers, uh, some special benefits when they try to get access to financial services in their place of refugee. Thank you. Perhaps we take a couple of comments first and then we respond. Maybe I'll ask a question as well. Hello, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Desmond Gardner. Uh, I'm from the EIB, uh, based in Luxembourg. Um, really interesting for me to hear about the fact that people are already opening accounts and that that activity is already happening. I guess that's mostly personal loans, is it? And how do you see the demand growing for credit amongst refugees, for example, around starting businesses and things? Or, or is it all happening at the same time? Thank you. Thank you, Desmond. Uh, perhaps we take a first comment and then we will make a first round of responses. So I can say that, um, Desmond, around um, your question, there, there are no, as far as we know, and we've been, done, we've been doing a, a mapping um, of the financial sector in the EU, it's really current accounts. It's really um, or wallets, like with the new banks, for example, with Revolut, with N26. So it's not loans, it's not credit. It, I think there have been some credit card um, issuances, but very, very, very limited. So Ukrainians are being able to use their Ukrainian credit cards issued in Ukraine, but in terms of in, in the EU countries and Moldova as well, when I speak EU, I also mean Moldova. Um, it's really a very limited transactional accounts that are being opened right now. So there is no uh, real substantial access to credit. Yes, also from my side, so we have not yet seen any major requests for, for credit because it's still also quite early in the, in the situation. Um, but uh, you were also asking about access to bank accounts, Desmond. So, for example, in, in Poland, the government is actively supporting um, access to bank accounts. So when refugees register in the country and register to the social assistance, they are directly also receiving service support to, to open bank accounts. So this is being done in large scale. And also in other countries, there are financial service providers that are actively engaged in supporting refugees to access bank accounts because, uh, I mean, as everybody is aware here in this group, um, having a bank account is really a basis in order to, to access economic inclusion, to access employment, to access housing, to, to access social protection, any other services. So, so it's a focus. From, from many governments and also financial service providers, uh, NGOs and the international community to support access to bank accounts. And we have not seen any key barriers in this regard. Rather, from what I, I have shared in the presentation, that there are challenges, but they can be overcome. So the legal framework is favorable and with information and awareness raising and multilingual procedures, access can be facilitated. And perhaps I just take the, the question of, of Katarina as well um, regarding any specific uh, programs for, um, for refugees. So, I mean, we have uh, the, uh, the EIB here and, uh, of course, the, the European Investment Fund has a, a specific program for, for refugees and migrants for, for accessing uh, financial services. DJ Near also has programs for, for non-EU countries um, that can support refugees' access to, to microfinance and to business development services. And together with the Microfinance Center, we are also in discussion in order to see how this can be translated in practice. 
So um, we are looking at, at different countries, not only as part of the Ukraine response, but also uh, for other countries for refugees access to finance. But in principle, there are different programs available, um, specifically focusing on refugees and migrants. But in general, it's also, um, I mean, it's refugees can also have access to the mainstream programs. So there is not necessarily a need to, to create um, to create targeted programs for, for refugees and migrants only, but considering that refugees oftentimes have additional needs um, because they are not familiar with the local context, they may not speak the, the language, they may need additional services in order to be able to, to access um, various business development services and also microcredit. So having special programs in this regard may be useful and also to to lower the risks of a uh, of financial service provider with regards to, to guarantees and so on. But we have very many positive examples of refugees um, having access to the mainstream programs of financial service providers. Over. Thank you. Is there anybody else who, who would like to to either respond to the question on the on the key challenges uh, they have experienced for for Ukrainian refugees to to access financial services, or regarding the needs they have identified for refugees um, and uh, access to financial services? So. So may I ask uh, also a question, Marine Kortenbusch from Business Finance Consulting. Uh, my question related to the businesses which are also working in Ukraine. And um, we speak about categories which are not refugees, but they cannot leave a country for business travel or so to provide for further business. We speak about category or the category where like we have a work, we want work, but in some situation, they cannot uh, do their work. Like, for example, in our company, we have free consultant there in Ukraine, but uh, they need to go to the projects, uh, for example, to Nepal or other countries, but they cannot leave the country because it's uh, like some people, they, they do not want to be refugees. They have a current international jobs or with international companies. But it's still maybe one question to raise about some category of people and their families who is now like in Lviv and some Ukrainian cities, but they, they're providing their work from home offices, but still the international businesses need them. And my question may be to you, Lilian and Susan, do you have also these uh, colleagues who is working for IFC and even for United Nations in Ukraine who cannot, like uh, men, yes, who cannot leave a country or how you, what's your recommendation for businesses who, is, who has colleagues and offices in Ukraine? Um, so, Marina, on that, yes, we, do, we, can, we have a very big office at uh, IFC World Bank. We have a big office in Ukraine. Um, there was a voluntary um, emergency evacuation of those who wanted to leave with their family members. But, uh, some decided to stay. <clears throat> so, um, and, you know, actually, we're, we're working with Katharina from Credit Info, who is in, in Lviv. Uh, with, with this credit bureau program. So, I mean, and she has expressed, and this is something we're trying to do as World Bank Group, the yeah, support of uh, HQ offices and the, and the teams around, you know, really, um, so this any kind of support that can be provided for the Ukrainians who are not able or not willing to leave because a lot of people have decided they want to stay, they want to fight, they have their personal reasons, but you have to respect, of course. And many, many people, and it's really unbelievable to me, are, are still working hard, you know, including Katarina herself, um, in bomb shelters with sirens. It's quite like an impression to, to see that commitment um, to really move things forward. We're working actually with the National Bank of Ukraine, who also is fully um, working 
um, despite the situation, um, to, to really move things forward. Farmers are planting, as you know, Ukraine is one of the biggest wheat exporters of the world. So um, in terms of recommendations, I've, there's nothing really I can say uh, in addition to really uh, the full respect and support that we are offering our colleagues, counterparts in terms of their commitment to their country and how we can support them, you know, outside in, in really engaging with the refugees who have left as well as providing all the support needed to keep moving the economy within Ukraine. Yes, yes, this is important. Yes, to, yeah. keep, to keep running like agriculture, economy. Yes. I mean, we've had conversations with, you know, the Ministry of Agriculture, with the NBU, with the credit bureaus. People are really fully dedicated in, in, in moving things forward. So it's, it's really incredible. Yeah, perhaps just to compliment, I mean, there are different initiatives from the private sector to support their workers in the country. So, for example, IKEA and remote coders are on the one hand uh, supporting the relocation of, of their employees, but also, for example, IKEA supports the men who remain in the country to see how um, yeah, they can cope with the, with the current situation. UNHCR, while focusing very much for now on the humanitarian assistance within Ukraine in, in the framework of, again, um, uh, international uh, community response led by OCHA is now also starting to again look at, at livelihoods issues and that is engaging with the private sector in order to see what are opportunities in this regard. And there are also different uh, job matching platforms available that offer remote employment opportunities that can also be um, done by, by Ukrainians still in Ukraine. So the employment is in another country, but uh, on distance, remotely, and this way Ukrainians are also able to, to obtain an income. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. It's good to just to raise uh, hands on the uh, raise hands, and then we can speak one by one. For those who have some technical different difficulties or other problems, maybe we can also use the chat box for sharing uh, some comments. So, Katerina, would you like to add something? Or? No, I think we can start. How many people we have there? Just, uh, do we have somebody uh, to start with? Uh, I think we are uh, 12 persons. So there should be some um, participants from FSPs maybe. Uh, so it will be nice to hear their uh, opinion and their perspectives on the challenges or solutions, potential opportunities. So please, those who, who, are, who, are, who can share and who will be volunteer. I see the representative from BCR, Becher, also. Hello. Uh, hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello, Erstegu. So, uh, uh, can you share your perspective? We know that you are doing a lot of initiatives around Ukrainian yeah, refugees. Yeah, actually, I'm representing a non-banking uh, financial institution, which is part of the BCR group. And BCR has done, uh, as, as a group and uh, as a bank, has done uh, uh, all that they, they could, all that we could actually to, to support the refugees in uh, in this process. And uh, as uh, to my knowledge, uh, it is still the only bank to exchange the Hrivnas for, um, uh, for the refugees uh, still in, in the country, uh, which I think it was a great help. Um, they also, uh, the bank also um, located um, um, relationship managers at the border to facilitate opening accounts uh, for the refugees on the spot. So uh, I think um, this has been done uh, um, in, in the beginning and it is still uh, going on. As a non-banking financial institution, we are not allowed to hold the credits of the, uh, the, the accounts of the, um, of the um, clients, but what we can do is uh, support them in uh, running their business or getting a loan. Uh, for the time being, we are only working with um, business loans. Uh, but uh, we made an inquiry with the EIF because we are the um, 
beneficiaries of the skills and education guarantee pilot, which offers support for uh, students to study and to get a loan uh, with a guarantee of the uh, EIF in, in the country. And um, to, um, the, the response was very positive. And um, uh, they said that we can include the Ukrainian refugees as well in, in the program. Um, the challenges that I would see, uh, n n we don't have a client yet in, uh, in that respect, but um, I think that people are still settling, uh, settling here, trying to, you know, um, cover uh, some other uh, needs and interests for the time being, like, uh, you know, finding a, a location, finding a job, uh, trying to, to accommodate. But what I would see for, from us, it would be the barrier of the language that I would see. Uh, this would be one of the, the barriers. Um, it, it is not only to get to, to, to discuss uh, with, the, with the refugees. Probably we could do this with translators. That would be one solution. But it's also the credit documentation and all the documentation related to the you know, banking services. Uh, one other thing is to get through our um, risk analysis <laughs> department, which is the credit history and how do we assess the uh, refugees do not have a business history um, or a credit history here in the country and uh, a connection with the credit bureau or uh, sorry, I don't know how you exactly call it uh, in Ukraine would be would be great, but um, I did not see Romania in uh, in I don't know what. How are the discussions with the, the, the credit bureau or, uh, in, in Romania? And then it is the, the, the uh, KYC and anti-money laundering procedures and everything that we have to run. And this has to go again through all the data databases. And um, this is uh, from our part to relate to, to the refugees. But it is also... Uh, um, like uh, I think uh, it was mentioned during the webinar, it is to, um, you know, to have like um, a training for our sales force to be able to understand the, the uh, issues and the, the problems of the, of the refugees and uh, where they come from uh, in terms of um, or in terms of their business culture and everything so to be able to adapt to a different target uh, clients because even if you run the same checks you still have to be able to to relate uh, uh, to, to the culture uh, to the business culture and to the culture of, of the, the refugee I think And we, we don't have a solution for that yet. I, if I had one, I would be very happy to share with you, but any suggestions or any you know, experience with that would be great. Romania did not have a great experience, a great uh, an important experience with refugees and migrants. We were not um, a country to, to receive uh, migrants or refugees until um, this uh, horrible war. And uh, this is why we do not have necessarily all this experience in place. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing your, your perspective. It's very, very um, important uh, ideas and also experience, so especially that we, we, we see that, that the language barrier could be very problematic also, even if the FSPs have the right products, if the communication is not appropriate, then it could create uh, additional problems. And also the, um, that uh, your status as a non-bank uh, financial institution doesn't all of you to offer the full services, yeah, full services. But that's uh, actually if if there are banks, so that the refugees have alternative options. So this is uh, also uh, important. And one very uh, important point that you mentioned is that there is a guarantee fund, yeah, guarantee fund, which is by third party, maybe by NGO or other non-commercial entities, and that can be used also for uh, lending uh, to, to refugees. So if the credit risk will be shared with uh, other counterparts, that that is uh, acceptable for financial institutions. So this is, yeah, realistic, realistically it is possible uh, as, as one of the solutions. Thank you very much again. 
other ideas, other experience? So maybe from other neighboring countries, if we have participant. Yeah, from from my uh, past experience, because I I, I had also uh, the experience in, in Georgia when we have the refugee crisis uh, two or three times. Um, of course, it is different because there's a different specific and uh, other uh, the, the pro problem. Uh, but um, this is sometimes a good opportunity for FSPs if you look from the perspective of of the financial institutions to look to the institutions it, itself from another perspective because. This time you can better test your internal systems, your risk management systems, how, how well you are ready for, to, to, to deal with this crisis and um, also to um, revise your social mission. Uh, because sometimes we see the, the nice papers and nicely defined the social mission and corporate social responsibility, all these uh, uh, things. But when you, you have the fact, when you have the real problem, then uh, the situation is different. So I think it's, uh, of course, it is the challenge, but also from another point, it is opportunity and, and uh, the solution that you see the real face of and the real uh, the, the resources of, of the institutions who, who are who, who and who can really offer the socially responsible uh, um, pro products. So this could be also one of the, from, from my side actually, uh, share. Any other ideas, maybe other questions, not, not, uh, not exactly for, for to these two questions, but if you have uh, open questions or any you know, uh, suggestions? Malhard, uh, maybe I can uh, just throw in a few, a few ideas into the pot. Sure. So it's uh, probably not the, the financial service provider's perspective, but listening to the uh, introductory presentations of our esteemed colleagues, there were a few things that came to my mind. And um, I guess in this case, it's, it's really looking into some specific features of the situation uh, created by the Russian invasion in Ukraine these days. And the nature and the type of people the, 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 the we are dealing with in terms of, of Ukrainian refugees. And uh, ongoing discussion is around, you know, the, 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 uh, the business lending, how to get there and so on. And here, here I come and I, when I look at uh, statistics, we had about 10% of self-employed people in Ukraine, mostly men who still stay in Ukraine. So what we deal with this, this, this specific kind of population, mostly women, mostly people who had uh, never been in, uh, in business and who used to have jobs. So that's one perspective. So that gives a, a little bit different, different uh, kind of point of view on the real needs. So uh, in my opinion, it's okay. At, at some point, yes, maybe, Partially, some of those people will be looking for self-employment opportunities. But in my opinion, the, 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 the most acute needs are very, very, very specific and practical, as we were mentioning, opening bank, bank accounts, creating a situation when the, the credit uh, information uh, is integrated so that, that people, those people can access at least some kind of, of uh, consumer loans and so on. But most importantly, probably the needs are in non-financial services area. That's information, that's access and facilitation of, uh, of uh, employment and so on and so forth. So while we, we, we do, do know our standard tricks of the industry, so to speak, let's always remember the specifics of this situation. On top of that, the, uh, the temporary protected person status granted by the EU and which is effective in all those countries provides an immediate oppor opportunity for employment in contrast to, to, to 
uh, to a uh, situation when, when Europe had to deal with some other refugee crisis where, where people were granted their refugee status, which did not allow for employment and so on and so forth. So again, whatever, whenever we are trying to develop some solutions, let's first and have a very, very uh, good look at actual situation. Hopefully, the, 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 some of the studies that uh, Mikola, I guess, announced will provide some, some more insights and some better prompts into specific solutions that would be more appropriate and more effective in this situation. Thank you very much, Volodymyr. Uh, exactly, I, I totally agree with you. And this is uh, also a uh, very unprecedented, uh, let's say, refugee crisis because uh, because of many, many reasons, because of the number of refugees, because of the yeah. uh, depths of the problems. And also we can say that we, we have some, let's say, experiences in industry, microfinance industry with the other refugee crisis, but it's absolutely yeah. different. It's absolutely uh, yeah. different. And, um, mm -hmm. When I hear, for example, about the idea to, to start some group lending <laughs> schemes, yeah. well, uh, I'm sorry, it, it never worked in Ukraine starting from uh, transition from the Soviet Union, never. One single program of group lending never happened in Ukraine. So just look into who you, who you are dealing with a little bit deeper before re really investing some resources into some solutions that might never be effective. Yeah, absolutely agree. And this is uh, the, the group lending was mainly uh, used in, in the Balkan countries in the beginning of 90s, I think. And this was the same, same history. So after some, the first phase of the this uh, refugee crisis, then it was totally uh, changed by individual lending, the same in Caucasus. But this is just mm -hmm. the models which exist. And yeah. of course, the, the, the based on specific demand and specific situation, the FSB just have this uh, list of the potential uh, business models and they should adapt. Uh, I think I, I just heard from one FSP that they might use some kind of the just different model of uh, group lending because if they mm -hmm. are, for instance, one woman employ one woman enterprise who can uh, start some, for instance the beauty salon and employ his, her neighbors uh, so it can be like used as a kind of the group lending but i absolutely agree that it's not the the right product right uh, right now excellent i think we can get started and i see you michael you're here if you want to give yes, us i'm going to find to your group uh without without my doing of anything <laughs> So we'll yeah, speak about welcome. the regulators and stakeholders, right? Exactly. You're most welcome. And actually, I would invite everyone to uh, turn on your video so that we can uh, see who's online. So we do have also functioning chat uh, where you're also free to um, uh, post your comments there. But essentially, in these 15 minutes, we wanted to have an exchange with you on those two questions that you can see here. So the first is how can development financial institutions, regulators and other stakeholders, so might be in general more like in the investor side, uh, but also um, microfinance network uh, and academia, uh, support financial service providers in boosting refugees' access to finance. Uh, probably the main stakeholders really wanted to discuss are the, the DFIs and the regulators because they are the ones that really can play a, a major role here. Then the second is, uh, what are the best practices uh, for supporting refugees providing the example by DFIs? I have some good practices in mind, but I would also like to hear from you if you have some ideas that you would like to exchange. So um, I would just like to, you know, you can open your mic uh, if you have any thoughts that you would like to, to share vocally, or again, you can also uh, use the chat. Uh, so if anyone wants to go ahead, uh, please do so. No, everyone is very shy. <laughs> So, I uh, maybe I I can uh, I can start just the, the facilitation and thinking about the possible role of development financial institutions. So we heard from IFC that they are pretty active uh, already uh, in um, 
in thinking about possible solutions to engage their partner uh, organizations in the neighboring countries uh, and also um, uh, both on, on market assessment and data facilitation with the credit bureau. And, uh, and also linking up to best practices. So we've been working with IFC, for example, in South America, and there are some market assessment that have been done. And I think uh, those assessment can also help think through um, the, the services needs of refugees, even if markets are very different. Of course, the Venezuelan situation is very different from the Ukrainian one. There are also investors that have been quite active. Uh, you might have heard of Grameen Credit Agricole Foundation that has been uh, investing in Uganda in financial service providers working with refugees. I'm sure many of you are interested in the setup of credit guarantee facilities. Um, although in our experience, uh, we can say that uh, uh, there is really no much difference in terms of uh, repayment capacity on loans between national clients uh, and the refugee population. This is really interestingly across geographies. Uh, the repayment rates, in fact, of refugees are, are quite high and sometimes they're even higher than uh, nationals. And we have data that we've been collecting and also from uh, from Kiva, uh, for example. But of course, the guarantees could also be quite interesting uh, to be structured, for example, when targeting a riskier type of, of clients, uh, such as startups or, or business run by, by youth or, or SMEs, of course, uh, that typically are, are riskier. So these are just some example of uh, of things that could be done for example to to support the risking but market assessment and data collection in the experience of your ECR is actually even more important than setting up a guarantees mechanism because once you get to know um, the market potential and you start to understand the financial services needs and the legal barriers are addressed and you have a clear understanding of uh, what documentation is needed what is considered to be valid in order to support the refugees, then it's, it's really just a matter of extending your services to them. Also because the Ukrainian situation is quite different from most of other refugee situation, where refugees, for example, are in remote uh, settlements in rural areas where there are no financial institutions there, and there is really a need to make an investment to set up the infrastructure. We are not really talking uh, about this in, in most of the countries. Uh, uh, most of the neighboring countries, at least, uh, although, of course, some more than others, we need additional uh, support also to, to set up activities or maybe to support with marketing tools. Um, so there are several uh, areas where I think DFI's donors also can, uh, can really help uh, um, collecting information and, and come up with the risky mechanism. So we'd like to stop here and really see if any of you would like to add anything, if you have any thoughts, uh, any question to UNHCR or in general to Michael. <laughs> so yeah, if, to thank, thank you very much, Michael. Um, I have a concrete question to the audience. I mean, we don't know exactly um, uh, um, who we have in the room here, but uh, we assume there will be uh, people in the room that uh, are dealing with financial services uh, to um, not only refugees, but uh, to uh, the, the population of their home country. So the thing is, wishes to DFIs in this situation that can ease their work or wishes to the regulator. So what is on your wish list, uh, um, uh, dear uh, FSP service providers or uh, anyway, uh, industry stakeholders? Uh, what would you like to be changed or added to the services or um, yeah, to the regulations that are already in place. Uh, because um, uh, with, with that change, it will make your life easier and the, the life of the clients in the first place. So any wishes, any suggestions, any demands? Because if really none, if, if everything is great, then I come with my second question. I would like to know from you uh, what's, what's working well already. So someone might want to share uh, an example uh, where um, a good change has been made or um, everything is good and why.
uh, I just hear silence, which makes me think that all participants here are very new to, <laughs> uh, to the subject. And so probably they have, uh, they're more of a listening mode. But um, it's, I think it's really important that any question you might have, uh, you know, you could, um, you could share it because I'm sure that uh, other have the same question too. So perhaps a, a good way to go, I don't know, but as I see a few names here, we aren't really a big group of people. Maybe we can really just, if everyone can introduce themselves and tell us, you know, why they are, why they're interested. I think it would be also a good way just for, um, you know, warm up and exchange. So I see here just in my list, there is a Stefano Balducci. So Stefano, if you could just like um, unmute yourself and you know which institution you work with and, and why you, you are interested uh, in this webinar. Yeah, <clears throat> well, I'm Stefano. I work in Banca Etica in Italy, in part of actually in the headquarters. And I'm the investment manager for uh, microcredit and microfinance with particular regard to the um, Central and Eastern European countries, uh, which means in this moment, the Balkan area in particular, and then maybe in the future, as the war is over, um, Ukraine as well, um, when reconstruction is going to come, or maybe when um, the refugees are going to be back to their homes if they um, we'll have any uh, after the war ends, actually. And I'm interested in this um, webinar because, um, well, I would say that I'm learning every day from, um, from, from you, actually, from UNHCR, and uh, we are part of Microfinance Center. We're members of Microfinance Center. And... Um, yeah, we are we, in Italy, at least at the moment, we do not have uh, this uh, big wave of uh, people moving from Ukraine. Actually, we do have some refugees, but um, the numbers are not that big as in the neighboring countries, of course. But still, we would like to, um, to think of something to um, serve those people. And we are working with the municipality of Padova here, where the headquarters are. Um, to facilitate the opening of a bank account for um, for young people, actually younger than 18. Um, they might come from Ukraine or they might come from any other country. But the most important problem is with um, the documents. Uh, we do need to... Um, comply with the regulations, uh, but still those people coming from abroad or just seeking refugee or uh, seeking asylum um, very often do not have the documents um, legislation requires. So we got to an agreement with, uh, uh, we are trying to get to an agreement to the, with the municipality of Padova where the municipality would, um, let's say, um, offer this kind of guarantee that those people are living in Padova. They have a residence and stay permit in Padova. And this should enable us to open bank accounts without any major problems. This is great, Stefan. It's a very concrete example and well done. <laughs> very, very yeah. proactive. That's exactly the way, the way to go. Um, maybe I see Alexandra Grigorescu. Um, if you can unmute yourself, Alexandra, if you're still there. It seems you are now there. So maybe um, Olena. Um, hi, I'm Olena Bukupovic uh, from IFC Ukraine. Um, and um, I'm, I have joined this meeting uh, primarily because my interest in the refugee support work, uh, which I see is currently doing, but also to learn from other organizations and um, also from the perspective of uh, financial institutions. So um, uh, to understand, uh, like, like I think as everyone was, has already mentioned during this uh, meeting that everyone is interested in, to understand the needs and the demands of uh, Ukrainians who were forced to leave the country. Um, uh, but uh, also this is, this is also my, one of my interests um, 
uh, and the reasons to join this meeting. Uh, but I understand that the research uh, has not, like IFC as well, uh, other organizations have not started the research yet. Um, uh, and probably because uh, many people uh, are still on the move and it, it takes, um, uh, it would make much more sense to do this research a bit later, at a later stage. Uh, but I was also interested to hear from financial institutions uh, what demands they do currently see from uh, Ukraine, coming up from Ukrainians. Like, um, as it was mentioned already today, that primarily interested in the opening bank account um, in the foreign exchange, etc. But uh, I was interested if uh, are there already requests uh, um, for to finance um, startups uh, or joint ventures uh, with um, uh, local companies or any, like any business credits, if there are any um, uh, need for a business credit already. And if yes, then. Uh, Mm, what issues uh, are faced uh, then both on the financial institution side to um, with KYC uh, or any any other issues? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I really think that the, that this uh, this assessment that IFC is gonna do is really gonna be key to answer all these questions. Uh, I don't know if we have an anecdotal evidence from people on the call that they would like to share. But if not, um, I see on the list also Andrei, um, Yasin, uh, Christian. Christian? Um, Hi, I'm Christian Jurm. I'm the general manager of a non BFI, non bank financial institution in Romania. Um, I belong to a group. Uh, which actually has a development project in Ukraine, financed by UCID. And also the group uh, has microfinance operations in uh, Lebanon and in Iraq, two countries that experienced uh, refugee crisis. And I am trying to uh, find some some answers to how we can, you know, as as a microfinance institution in Romania, uh, support the refugees. Uh, we have some lessons and we have the experience of uh, uh, refugees in, in Lebanon. Uh, I think that the situation is slightly different uh, because you know all the assistance that is given by European Union through the uh, local government and probably uh, the expectations and, and where in uh, Syria most likely refugees went there and they, they have received minimum uh, assistance from the, the local government. The situation is different in, in, in Europe. Uh, and I, I'm, I question whether the immediate need is uh, access to, to finance besides, you know, opening a bank account, transferring some, some money, um, you know, the, the Romanian government, pro probably similar to other countries, neighboring countries, have uh, lifted the working permits. So uh, th there are other ways um, the, the Ukrainian um, refugees have, can support themselves in the immediate uh, uh, phase. Uh, but I'm trying to understand, you know, what else we can do and how, you know, how we can play a role. That's great. Thank you very much. We have um, 10 seconds left, so we are now going to regroup in the plenary. But thank you very much for your time. And um, uh, yeah, keep, uh, 
keep being engaged on this. Thank you. I'd like to ask Susanne and Liliana to give us a short wrap up what happened in group one, which was supposed to speak about the refugee perspective. So what were the discussions and what were the main takeaways from it? Susanne and Liliana. Thanks a lot, Michael. Um, we did not have any additional uh, key challenges that have been identified uh, by the participants, but rather focused our discussion on what kind of support is already being provided to um, to microfinance institutions that are interested in in engaging um, or including refugees in in their portfolio. So we provided the quick overview on uh, different programs available by the European Development. Um, sorry, by the European Investment Bank, by the European Investment Fund, and by uh, by the Council of Europe Development Bank um, and uh, DG Near in this regard. And uh, another question was also um, what we see with regards uh, of demands for, for credits and the financial services in general. Um, so for now, from our perspective, of course, with a limited overview, but uh, we see that the main focus for now is on accessing uh, basic financial services as regards to, to bank accounts, uh, to payment services, and to exchanging the, the currency. Uh, while we have not seen big demands yet for credits, as we have seen before, we are still very much in the first phase um, of the emergency response in this in the in the arrival, so there is not yet such a focus on on setting up um, a business, and this is why there has not been so many demands for for credits. But we expect this to to expand, and we also had a very brief discussion on what is the support um, available for Ukrainians within Ukraine, and the um, different. Um, efforts in order to to support the the future reconstruction in the country um in order to to ensure that uh refugee uh, well, the livelihoods of the of the idps and the local population in general can be uh restored and um yeah that people will be able again to to make a living within ukraine oh boy. Thank you very much, Susanne. That was a good comprehensive summary. And uh, thanks to all participants of the uh, group one for giving your insights and sharing them actively. And uh, let's go to group two now, the financial service providers perspective. Uh, Malchas, Katerina, what are your takeaways from the group discussion? Thank you, Michael. So let, let, me, let me start. Uh, so we have the interesting discussions and sharing the, the, our experience from the perspective of the FSPs. Uh, so among the key challenges, we, we listed uh, some very interesting topics. Some, some of them we also touched with during the uh, presentation, but some of them are new. For example, uh, one of the challenges could be language barrier. So uh, when uh, refugees are uh, you know, the cooperating with uh, the FSPs, if there will be problem with communication, language communication could create the uh, challenges and problems. Also, there are uh, problems with um, KYC and ML procedures because of the lack of access to the credit bureau and information as, as we talked during the presentation. Uh, we also see that uh, because of the specific of these problems, because as we know, the majority part of refugees are women and children and not the men. And because of the women, they, they are not uh, so actively involved in, in, in the business, small business in, in the Ukraine. So they, they, they are not self-employed. So that's why potentially uh, the, 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 the clients for uh, classical MFIs, which is the, the self-employed or entrepreneurs, uh, could not be so, so many you know, uh, potential clients because of this specific situation. Uh, also, um, the challenge is that not all uh, refugee funding model which were tested in other countries could be adequately uh, used in this time for instance group lending uh, and i also agree that uh, it's uh, directly it's it's not the right product maybe maybe with some modification but because of the specific of the the, the situation group lending might not uh, cannot seem as, as a right product for the ukrainian refugees uh, as for the uh, potential solutions there is um, several ideas for instance we we said that uh, 
non-financial services uh, right now uh, demand for non-financial services is dominating and we expect that during some months this will be also dominating rather than just classical lending uh, products also um, uh, it could be used as a guarantee fund for the students and other uh, type, type of refugees so it is with cooperation with third parties when uh, fsps are providing their financial products but guarantees there is a guarantee fund guaranteed by NGO or other counterparts who share the risks. So it could be one of the solutions. And also to respond to the, the problems and challenge of the less experience of the refugee fi finance uh, among FSPs, there could be some specific training for the staff who are directly involved in the refugee uh, finance uh, in the future. So I think uh, I don't miss anything. Uh, Katerina, maybe you can add if I miss anything. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank Mahas, you, and thank uh, you, participants. Yeah, thank you very much, Marhas and Katerina, for um, co coordinating the group and for giving us a feedback on that. That uh, sounds like a number of very concrete things uh, that came up on your desk, uh, very useful. And with that, uh, we move to the last and the third group, um, where Mikol was uh, coordinating the group. And Mikol, uh, what were the main takeaways? Yes, I think I, I can start off by uh, as a segue to what Mike was just pointing out, which is uh, the interest that often FSPs have a, um, about guarantees. And this was the group to discuss about the role of DFIs. And I was just sharing the fact that uh, um, data so far tell us that actually refugee repayment rates uh, across the world are actually very similar to the one of nationals. So the low repayments actually are, are pretty good. Uh, usually uh, they're even better than, uh, than the one of nationals in, in many countries. Nevertheless, Guarantees uh, can still, of course, be of interest uh, for some sub-segment of refugees that look riskier. It could be startup or SME finance, for example, or youth business. And there are some examples of guarantees that have been uh, structured. Uh, I also saw that it was Philippe on the list of participants as Gramin Credit Agricole Foundation, for example, has been a partner in serving refugees. So this is uh, also, I think, a, a one of the important points to, to, to keep being discussed. We had uh, in our um, group uh, a representative from Banca Etica in Italy, and they shared uh, something very interesting, uh, which is essentially um, what we've been flagging here, that uh, documentation is key, and actually there is a a problem with compliance and documentation that has already been observed in Italy as Bancatica is trying to open up bank account for uh, minors, for actually for youth. Um, and uh, they are now working with the municipality of Padova to ensure that the municipality can really be the guarantor to confirm to the bank uh, that they have residence permit in order to be able to, to open a bank account in order that the bank can comply to KUSC. And so this came up as documentation as an important point. And the other one is data. So the financial service providers in the group are very interested in uh, um, considering refugees as a possible target market. Uh, however, there is a need to also link up with the Ukrainian financial sector to really have access to um, information to do proper risk management, uh, as well as data that can come up from the, the demand uh, side of the financial assessment that we hope IFC can, can carry out soon because this will really help us that's the segment the market um i don't know michael if you have anything else that you would like to add since you were in our group no thank you very much nicole i think you covered it all very well and uh, um it gives a good summary thank you so uh with that we have uh, heard all the three groups and uh, we're coming also to the end of our webinar i would like once more a few housekeeping items before we, before we close in two minutes. Uh, so once more, um, thank you for participating in the survey um, that uh, will help us really to improve future uh, webinars of this type. And uh, also, um, I think the webinar showed to me that uh, uh, it's a topic that is very dynamic. Um, that is, um, we are kind of sailing in uncharted waters. It's very unique. Um, it's um, uh, evolving 
So uh, our sight uh, distance is not very far. We can only look at the uh, immediate situation. And uh, I think that was good today to get a, a snapshot from different angels, from the angel of the refugees uh, perspective from the FSPs, and also looking at the DFIs and the regulatory environment uh, from a high profile panel. I really thank all of you, uh, Susanne, Liliana, Malchas, uh, Katerina, Mikol, uh, for giving uh, great insights and spending your time uh, for being in this webinar. That was uh, very good. And uh, yeah, we are all lined up for the next one because situation uh, requires to stay on the ball. Uh, so the next one will be on uh, May 24th. Uh, so in about a month, uh, also at 2.30 starting, you will all will get an, um, an invite and it will be again, refugee fines in times of uncertainty, mitigating risk, identifying opportunities uh, with a slightly uh, different angel. So we'll have a larger focus on Eastern European, also Central Asian countries. So also looking a bit at indirect impact of, uh, the, um, uh, of the situation of the refugee crisis. Um, and uh, it should be complementary to the one we, um, we had today. And would be happy to see um, as many or even more uh, than today. I think we had a great interest today. Um, so uh, a good number of participants. And um, yeah, I look forward to continue the discussion. Before I close, um, there will be a link copied in the, uh, in the chat window here from uh, BFC's FinTech Bulletin. It's a free of charge publication. Uh, that you can uh, download or subscribe to. And uh, it has a relevance for this theme as well, of course, because it's about fintech, about finance. So one of the future themes we'll be discussing how digital finance actually also can play a certain role in um, helping refugees to improve their access to finance. Um, and that will also be coming up. Yeah, it was a wonderful webinar. I really um, uh, enjoyed uh, to be uh, with all of you. Thanks again and give a big hand to our uh, great panelists today and uh, to our audience for being with us for the 90 minutes. And of course, to our sponsors, Triple Jump and Microfinance Center. And see you soon again in one month from now. Take care, stay healthy and keep up the good work. Bye bye for now. <laughs>